Good morning and welcome to AXA Coral Live. Delighted that you're joining us here at Kamabi Research Station on Curaçao. Now Curaçao is in the Caribbean, it's part of the Netherlands Antilles together with Aruba and Bonaire. And we're in the Southern Caribbean, we are just off the coast of Venezuela here, which is about 50 kilometers this way. Now, Kamabi, our home for Coral Live, is a field research station. And that means not only is a permanent research taking place here, but also visiting scientists can come and do projects here for a number of weeks or even months. And the great thing about having a field research station here is that those visiting scientists have access to a whole host of facilities. Now, that could be dry labs, where they can do experiments, analyze samples, use scientific equipment, such as microscopes. And it's also the wet labs that we saw on Tuesday. And that's where further experiments can be done to compare what's happening on the reef behind me to isolate some specific factors that they want to investigate. Now, being a field research station, there's a, there's a reason why we're here, and there's a reason why Kamabi's here. It's next to the great outdoors, next to the field, the coral reef just behind me. And that means that researchers can be in the lab, designing projects, and also just come down the beach, grab their scuba gear. If they're going even deeper, they might be using rebreather technology and Pim will be telling us all about that in the Meet the Expert session following this one. And it's incredible to have that combination of science facility and the reef. And it's a truly extraordinary habitat, just 50 meters offshore here. Wonderful elk horn coral round the corner from us. And even some brain coral growing on the jetty that we're sitting on. So that combination of science, facility, the great outdoors, the wonder of the reef, really making Kamabi a special place to be working. Today's first session is a live investigation. And the theme of today is really about working deeper on the reef. So we've talked a lot about some of the work that's being done, and that's really happening between 0 and 15, 20 meters. Today we're looking at the effects of depth on both pressure and light. And we'll think about how that might affect some of the life we find in the ocean. Before we get into our live investigation, we're just going to see who's watching. I've got some shout outs here. We've got schools from the UK, from Lithuania, Morocco, the US and Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, all of you, welcome one and all. And shout outs to um, Bartholomew's Church of England Primary School. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for Coral Live and really proud of all the thinking and learning that you have done this week. So big uh, hello from the Caribbean to you guys. Um, a shout out to Clitha um, Primary School in Newport, uh, Wales, tuned in today. Really great to have you with us again. Um, hello again to Leitham Primary School from Chile, Scotland. Um, well, we'll try and send some warm currents your way. Um, and it is uh, Abby's 12th birthday today. Uh, so massive, ma massive happy birthday uh, to Abby. Um, hope you're having a great, great day. So big warm wishes and happy birthdays uh, from Curaçao. Hello, uh, also from Union Point Academy in Kentucky in the US. Hope it's getting warmer where you are. And a big thank you uh, to Miss Fraser's Year 6 class at Stoke Lodge Primary who are watching from the UK. Good morning to all the students there. Uh, thank you for joining us. So the structure of this live lesson, this live investigation, 
is we're going to do our investigation first and I'll go through some of the equipment um, that we'll need for that. Then we'll have a bit of a, a break and we'll change it around and we'll come on to the Q&A section. So that's with both the pre-submitted questions and please do join in the live chat as well. And that means that we can ask you questions, get some feedback. If there's anything that I say that's not clear and you'd like me to go over it again, just pop that on the live chat, get in touch with the Encounter EDU team and we'll be very happy to build that feedback into this session. Uh, great if you want to share um, what your students are up to. We love receiving um, pictures of the, the feedback um, sheets and all that kind of thing, the, the uh, photographs of you guys working and the social media handle is at EncounterEDU and the hashtag is CoralLive2019. So without further ado, we have two um, live investigations for you. Um, one looking at the effect of depth on pressure. So we've got lots of mosquitoes this morning. So if I sort of wave in the air, uh, that's what's happening. Uh, so looking at the effects of depth on pressure and the second one's looking at the effect of depth on available light. Now, for the first one, looking at the effects of depth on pressure, you'll need just a few things. You'll need a bottle. Uh, you will need something to make holes in the bottle. And uh, this is something your teacher should be doing, so you need quite a sharp implement, either the end of a pair of scissors, or in my case, a handy screwdriver. You'll need some big tape, some nice, really sticky tape. And then you'll need access to the ocean to get your water. Don't worry if you don't have an ocean in your classroom, you can use the tap. Uh, for the second live investigation where we're looking at the impact of uh, depth on available light, you'll need a few more things. You'll need a container, a clear container that you can fill up. You'll need water from the ocean or a tap. Blue food colouring is also um, really useful because it uh, accentuates um, the effect that we're looking at. Uh, there's a nice um, some Dutch language skills for you all this morning. And for the uh, looking at the impact of depth on available light, uh, we are using a, a mobile app called Science Journal and that helps to turn most uh, mobile phones into a scientific sensor, including a light meter. Uh, so we'll be looking at that in just a bit. You can use other ways if you have other light meters available at your school, or you just want to observe and maybe put a sheet of paper underneath and see whether you can observe any changes with the naked eye. That's also something you can do. So, there's some key words coming up. We've got a couple of anagrams to get you started. You can also use this as an opportunity to get all the equipment um, sorted for your students and to put any questions up on the live chat. So see if you can solve these.
Hi there, uh, some slightly simpler anagrams this morning. So I hope you got both depth. So as we go down in the, into the ocean, what happens and light. Now, light is incredibly important for the reef building coral. So as we've been talking about this week, reef growing coral is in fact an animal, the coral polyp and it grows a thin layer over a rocky structure that it creates, taking minerals from the ocean. But it needs a turbo charge to be able to grow and create this amazing structure. And it gets that from having plant-like algae inside its tissue, getting up to 90% of its energy from that source. Now, as many of you will know through your science lessons, one of the things that plants need to create sugars is light. So we need to think about how light may affect corals in the ocean. But the first thing we're gonna look at is our live investigation on the relationship between pressure and depth. So I'm hitting, sitting here at sea level uh, where the pressure is one atmosphere or one bar. And I want to see if there's a relationship. If I go deeper into the sea, will the pressure go up? So what I need for this is my first plastic bottle. And I'm going to put three holes along the side at equal points. And I'll just get this up. Get the first one up there. Let's hold this, blow away the little beasties. Put the second one in there. And then the last one at the bottom. Okay, so you need those three holes in a straight line. So the in a straight line here. And remember, an adult helping you to do that. I'm just gonna put this down because then it's gonna tape up these holes. And this is really important before you fill it with water. Move my phone out of the way, don't want to get that wet. Get my tape ready. Very important to have gaffer tape on an expedition. Useful for fixing a whole load of things and also likes to stick to itself. Oh. See if it will behave. I'm gonna line it up over those holes and smush it down. Very technical scientific language, but make sure it's nice and tight over there. Okay, now what you'll need to do is you'll need to fill your bottle up with water and as soon as it's full, put the top back on. So if you don't have an ocean, use a tap. I'm just gonna go down to the sea and fill my bottle up. So just filling up here, try not to get bitten by crabs or eels, or get completely wet, not working through there. I'm going to have to go a bit deep, deeper, and hopefully I don't put the mic in the ocean. Oh, here we go. So making sure you have all this full up and then once it's full getting the top back on don't get washed away while you're doing this ah, there we go get the top back on and so what we're going to try and predict is how the water 
will come out of these holes. Will it all come out at the same rate? Am I? So what I'm going to do, quickly peel off and see how the water comes out of these different holes. Wow, so hardly at all out of the, oh, take the lid off, forgot that bit. Hardly at all out of the top one. A jet that's coming just to here on the middle one. And we can see the increased pressure pushing this bottom jet further out. And as the depth decreases, we can just watch this bottom one. We'll see it should start to move back as the depth of the available water goes down. We'll see the pressure decreases and this jet isn't forced out as far. Here we go. We're going to see this trickling back down this way. I should, sorry teachers, I should have mentioned that it's really good to do this in the sink <laughs> and not on the desk. So, I hope what you guys observed is that relationship between pressure and depth. So we see how the water is behaving differently as it comes out of the different holes. So the top hole with less depth, we see the water not coming out as far as the depth goes down a little bit further and then right at the bottom even further. So that's just a little demonstration to show you the relationship between pressure and depth. We can talk a little bit later, maybe through some of the Q&A about how that might affect some of the life in the ocean. I'm just going to put that in my pocket so it doesn't get into the ocean. Now, just to give you some background on this, for each 10 meters you go down, the pressure increases by one bar or one atmosphere. So, at sea level we're here, the pressure is one atmosphere. If I went 10 meters down into the ocean, it would be two atmospheres, 20 meters, three atmospheres, and so on and so on and so on all the way to the very bottom of the ocean, the pressure increasing. And all those numbers, those atmospheres, may not make much sense, or just maybe just numbers to you. But imagine this, the pressure at the bottom of the ocean, now I all want you to imagine you've got the Eiffel Tower in your hands, because you're incredibly strong this morning, you're going to take the Eiffel Tower, you're going to turn it upside down, and you're going to put it on your big toe. And that is the equivalent pressure of all that height of water that you would experience at the bottom of the ocean. We're going to move on, having looked at the observing that pressure increases with depth, we're now going to move on to consider how depth might affect available light. I'm just going to do the setup of this right in front of me. I've got my ocean tub. I've got my mobile phone and I'm just going to open up the Science Journal app. There are instructions on how to use the Science Journal app on our website and in case you don't have those to hand, those can be shared by the team. So I've got my ocean and I'm just going to create a little space 
using these empty VHS cassette boxes, which teachers will know what these are, students may not. So I've got a little space under here where I'm going to put my phone. So I'm going to put the light meter under here and I'm going to start recording what happens. Into here, I'm going to put water, I'm going to use some blue food dye to increase the effect. So again, Ellie, I'm just going to talk through uh, what's going on, but I'm just going to go and get some water down from the ocean. What we're looking at, Hello, and this is really important, Jamie. as I mentioned before, Can for, you take this one? for take reef growing coral. So the, Perfect. So, what we've discovered is that the intense tropical heat uh, is melting everything. And so, I'm just going to put another microphone on so you can hear me better when I'm down next to um, collecting some water. It looks like I'm wearing a sponge around my neck. Um, so, just going to go and get this. And we can think about the availability of light, why that might be important for living things. And whether we can see any difference. We're going to do this a couple of times. So, making sure you're all set up. Add some blue food colouring with my wet hands. Luckily I've got a blue t-shirt on so nobody's going to see the stains. There we go. Mix that up a bit. And I'll get on my science journal app an initial reading my hands now covered in seawater and everything else so putting my sensor under here I can see I've got a figure of 861 looks coming up I don't want to move it too much because I actually want to see what the difference is I'm going to put half this bottle in and see whether there's any change. You press record. What do you think is going to happen to the graph on my screen? If I pour this in. Oh, just over half. See if I can find that reading here. So I've got a graph on here and it's going to show the time by time pouring in the water. Now is the available light going to go like this, go up, or is the available light going to go down? What do we reckon? And then I'll turn my graph around, see if I can get it on its side. No, it's not going to happen like that, but here we go. So we can clearly see that as I've been pouring in this blue water, that the available light has gone down. I will just start this again and finish off the bottle.
I'm just going to bring this back up and I'll play back this graph. So you can see here, it's wonderful tone. And then down to the bottom there, as you can see that amount of available light decreasing and then just as I brought it out, it goes back up again. These are just really two investigations we're, we're predicting and observing what happens with depth. And then through considering, we can think, okay, if there's less available light, as we've seen, and there's more pressure, how might that affect life in the deep ocean? What's great is that we have Pim, who's one of the researchers here and who I met seven years ago working on the deep reef on the Great Barrier Reef, to talk a little bit more about his actual experience of seeing the changes as he's gone down the reef. We can do some Q&As now, but do join us in just a little bit. He's also got his specialist scuba gear uh, to show us how people can stay alive when they're studying down there. So your desks or sinks or classrooms may be awash with blue food dye with um, bits and bobs from these live investigations. So just before we switch to the Q&A section of this live lesson, we've got a couple of predictions for you coming up. Do have a go at those, get yourself set, and we'll move to the live Q&A section. I wonder how you got on with those. Uh, so some really, really deep diving there um, from Ahmed uh, Gaba uh, in the Red Sea, uh, an amazing 330 hot meters down. Uh, that's really sort of looking at sort of, wow, wow, over eight or nine times, perhaps even 10 times the depth uh, of your normal um, scuba or certainly some of the scuba ring. Uh, diving that is done here. Uh, we've also got the deepest point uh, in the ocean. Uh, I find it amazing, height of Everest, 8,848 meters down, up, sorry, height of Everest, up, <laughs> 8,848 meters up. Uh, and then we go down uh, into the Marianas Trench and the Challenger Deep. Now there's a current controversy um, over the true depth of the Marianas French. Um, there have been various expeditions that have been going down there. Um, and in fact, well, just three um, expeditions that have gone down. We've had the Trieste uh, with Walsh and Picard. Then we had uh, James Cameron, uh, the film director. And just this year, we have had Victor Vescovo as part of the Five Deeps expedition very, very hard to find the deepest point in the ocean and a lot of technical equipment being used, but hopefully you've got 10,927. In fact, we believe it might be even deeper at 10,972. Um, but it's tricky uh, to, to find out the depth. You have to use sonar, sound waves, 
and the sound waves will behave differently in different types of ocean water. So really complex stuff. Brilliant. We're going to come on to your questions now. I'll just get those up. And we have from um, Leatham Primary School, we have why did you want to become a coral scientist and what do you like best about coral? So it's been wonderful working with coral scientists over the past seven years. My background is more in the sort of expedition and science communication side. But I think for me and definitely for many of the researchers I've worked with, it's been that first dive. That first dive on the reef to see the abundance of this underwater city, the movement, the colours, the diversity. And what I like best about coral is that it is a habitat forming animal and that means that it creates structures for a wealth of other marine life so it's not just the coral that's amazing but it's the fact that it supports about 25 percent of all the species in our ocean do coral polyps have a digestive system yes they do they're like they're animals uh, like us, we heard yesterday though, uh, they have a rather um, more disgusting way of pooping um, by exuding that uh, through their tissue. Um, so that's how they get rid of the waste matter, but they have mouth digestive tract and then they get rid of their waste just like us, but in a rather different way. Uh, Question three from Leatham Primary School. If coral communities get ripped apart, will they die? Some will and some won't. There are a thousand different coral species around the world and they all behave differently. So some species have adapted to the fact they might get broken up by big storms. And so they go, ah, thanks. And I've been planted somewhere else on the reef and they can regrow. Some others will suffer and perhaps not survive. Uh, do fish sleep in the coral? Yes, they do sleep in the coral. Uh, wonderful uh, imagery of parrotfish making their own sleeping bags, as it were, out of mucus, and they use that to, um, to sort of hide their smell uh, from potential predators like reef sharks that might be hunting at night. Uh, do coral polyps sleep? Um, they have behaviors um, during the day where they're more photosynthesizing, so the algae uh, will be uh, getting energy from the sun, and then at night more hunting uh, with their tentacles. So not much rest uh, for the coral polyp. Uh, I th uh primary school, uh, wow. Uh, Mayor would wa wants to know what is the deepest depth that divers are able to reach now there's certainly some sort of very competitive diving going on. We saw that with one of the predictions um, with you know, divers going beyond 300 meters. But really in terms of science diving, you're talking about a depth of 100 meters, uh, 300 feet as just an operational limit to go down and do something useful, as it were. So perhaps doing uh, long transects, long studies of the seafloor at that depth. And those are technical divers using um, mixed air and using uh, rebreather equipment. Uh, and we'll have a go at that in about an hour's time or so. Um, so we've got a question here um, from Thomas O. Um, and he would like to know, how does the water have so much pressure? Um, I think the simplest thing to think about is uh, Thomas, and do this with a teacher, uh, get, uh, stand up and feel the pressure from the atmosphere, and then put a bottle of water on your head and see how that feels. So it's simply the mass of that water above your, um, above the object, and it's that that causes it. So if you can imagine if you're at the, the, the bottom of the ocean, not only do you have this sort of vertical 
shaft of air on top of you, but you also have a vertical shaft of water and water being uh, denser than air that will have more pressure. Um, we have lied how far down have we explored and what is the pressure there. Explored is, is a really tricky one. Um, so there's, there's some so interesting um, expeditions using ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, um, going down to sort of 5,000, 6,000. I think the deepest ROV um, operates at around 8,000 meters. And that's exploring and sampling and looking at some of the deep ocean habitats and systems. In terms of going down and just getting somewhere and, and just taking a few samples, uh, then the depth there is, is nigh on um, 11 kilometers, so 11,000 meters. And the pressure there, we work out pressure with um, one bar or one atmosphere equivalent for each 10 meters, so it's, a, it's pretty incredible, 1,100 atmospheres down there. Uh, how deep can divers go without getting crushed? And that's from Manor. Uh, it's a really interesting one um, about whether it's getting crushed that's the limit of how deep we can dive or whether it is how the air behaves inside our bodies. And there are some difficulties with air coming out of solution, with oxygen becoming toxic, at, at deeper depths, uh, using um, ways to balance out um, the nitrogen becoming um, an issue, uh, using helium as, as, as an alternative, uh, bringing the oxygen levels down. So there's all types of things where we're looking at how gas behaves at pressure inside our bodies, and, and that's you know, a really big limit uh, to how we work underwater. Are there animals living in the deepest parts of our ocean? If so, how can they survive? That's a really great question. So there's, there's a couple of things that they have to look out for. So first of all is how they cope uh, with the pressure. Uh, a lot of that is by reducing the amount of structure in their body, so quite fleshy organisms. Um, some of it might be um, not having any air inside because the air is going to behave uh, very differently. Um, and then the, the, the other question is where they're going to get their food from. And in the deep ocean there's two main sources of food. There's food from above and there's food from below. Now food from above is, is fairly obvious. Uh, you have uh, falling particles whether that's waste matter or, or dying um, small creatures, and that all floats down through the ocean uh, and known as marine snow um, as it comes down. Then on, you know, within that you might have uh, whales uh, dying and landing on, on, on the, the sea floor, and that's a sort of a massive feast uh, for many of the animals uh, that live down there. Uh, so you see all kinds of animals swarming in and around um, the, the carcass and the body uh, of a whale, a whale falling down. Now, on the other hand, you have uh, food from below. And this is where some of the science we learn at school turns out not to be quite right. Uh, so we learned that, you know, food chains all need uh, the sun to start with and photosynthesis and producers, uh, that all starts with the sun. Uh, in fact, there is a, another um, form of where energy starts, and that's called chemosynthesis, so using um, both the heat and the chemicals in the deep ocean, and especially around deep sea vents, uh, which are almost like underwater uh, volcanoes with these hot gases uh, coming up um, from under the uh, bottom of the ocean. And that starts with uh, vent bacteria, transforming that into uh, something. So we've just got a couple of chickens coming, um, Ellie, so we'll watch they don't get electrocuted. Um, and so 
sorry, I've lost my train of thread for, through through the morning chicken run. Um, so they um, bacteria turn that into um, something that can be ingested, and then you get uh, uh, bent worms and a whole bent shrimps, and a whole community just starts to build up around there. And one of my favourites um, of the deep deep sea vent community are yeti crabs. Um, so have a look for yeti crabs and think about why they are so named. Um, if you can find a photo of them, Fion, that was a great question. Thanks so much. So we've got a couple of things um, about the survival of deep sea species. Um, Union Point Academy, wonderful to have you with us. Um, how deep can coral be found in our oceans? Really interesting to think about two types of coral. So we looked at there being decreasing levels of light and we've also talked about how the reef building tropical coral that we're talking about here mostly, how that depends on light. You do get deep ocean corals down to about 6,000 meters. Obviously there's no available light down there and so they aren't photosynthesizing, they don't have that uh, mutualistic relationship symbiosis with the algae inside their tissues uh, relying on using their tentacles to catch food in terms of the deepest you know photosynthesizing corals with their friendly algae helpers um, the deepest has been found on the Great Barrier Reef um, 125 meters down and that was by PIM I think it was in 2012, or the 2012 expedition, um, that he found that, and he can tell you all about uh, that discovery um, that he made um, in the next session. Um, how do they survive without much light? Well, so you've got, if you're talking about deeper corals, on what we call the mesophotic reef. Um, Phosic just meaning um, the sort of a light zone of an ocean. Meso meaning a little bit basically. Uh, it's also called the twilight zone and what we see is that many of the corals in that part of the ocean adapt in a, a couple of ways. Uh, so they might be flatter out uh, to more like a solar panel to receive as much of the available sunlight as possible. They also might be darker and the darkness caused by more and more of the little uh, algae inside the tissue being more concentrated. So not only do they look like a solar panel, but they've also got as many sort of light receiving algae as possible. So that's a couple of ways that they have adapted for deeper coral and cold water corals. Uh, then it's the fact that they probably grow a bit slower. They do grow a bit slower, um, but they're also using just their tentacles uh, to catch food like a sea anemone um, or a jellyfish using that method of getting food. Um, St Bartholomew's Church of England Primary School. Uh, are there specific coral or fish native to the area? And I think what's really interesting um, to the students at St Bartholomew's, okay, so modern corals all started really in the Indo-Pacific region. And if you can imagine, if you've got a map on the wall or, or a globe, if you can imagine a triangle, what's called a coral triangle, with <coughs> Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, just, just to the north of Australia. That's really the sort of like base for corals, um, modern corals. Now, when they are around, uh, North and South America were apart, and so there's a gap to get from the Pacific Ocean into the Caribbean. So a few of these corals made the long and arduous uh, journey on the ocean currents going from island to island and eventually coming into the Caribbean. Now that closed up that gap between North and South America and so we have different corals growing here in the Caribbean than we do uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so that's been sort of, those have been cut off. There are a couple of, I think, at least one example of a uh, Pacific coral being carried by a ship um, into, the, into the Caribbean. In terms of species, uh, certainly one of the most famous species in Nassau grouper. Um, in terms of Curacao specifically, um, there, I think there's, there's one uh, crinoid um, which is 
related to a starfish and, and, and uh, sea urchins that is endemic and that's the word that we use to say that something's only found in a single place that's endemic to Curaçao. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea about how the Caribbean reefs are unique compared uh, to the reefs in other parts of the world. Uh, do I have a favorite type of coral? That's a great question from St. Bartholomew's. Um, I'm rather partial to a brain coral um, because I think they're great because they look like their brains just plonked on the sea floor. I think that's pretty cool. I'm quite partial to an elkhorn coral. Uh, I think they look wonderful and they're on the uh, Coral Live stickers um, that we've got. Um, so those are really fantastic. And there's a really great elkhorn coral um, sort of reef just around the corner here. And maybe we'll get a chance to visit it after the live broadcast this week. Uh, really lovely story in so far as they were really declining a lot across the Caribbean um, became endangered and now we're seeing uh, more recovery of that species so really lovely to see the elk horn coming back uh, do you think there are still more coral that we have not discovered yet certainly there is more coral uh, that we have not discovered yet uh, and so we need you guys uh, to come and help us find out what is there uh, so especially the deep ocean probably stacks of deep ocean corals um, ready to be found and even though many of the reefs have been well documented definitely probably a new 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 coral out there what's really interesting though is that we may have already seen a new species without realizing it and talking to valerie one of the researchers here on monday she was saying how there were two species that were, looked exactly the same, behaved pretty similarly, but now they're doing genetics tests, they're finding out that they're genetically different and could actually be uh, two different species. Uh, what weird, wonderful or dangerous coral have you seen? Weird, wonderful or dangerous? Now, weird, one, weird wonderful, oh, the brains are pretty weird. Um, wonderful, I think, are the um, big uh, boulder coral, the parietes that you find on the Great Barrier Reef, the huge um, boulder corals which are speckled with Christmas tree worms. Do have a look at a Christmas tree worm online. Um, they're pretty, pretty um, funny little creatures. Uh, and so th those are pretty amazing. Uh, and I, then I think, um, I think it's probably the brain brain and, and the big boulder corals that, that for me are the amazing ones. And then this is wonderful of going through what's like a sort of underwater forest of these um, elk horn corals, which is also pretty cool as well. Um, last question that we've got pre-submitted from St. Bartholomew's. Uh, what things depend on coral to survive? Quite, we've run out of time. I've just gone over massively. You're all wonderful. Um, I've got two more questions. Um, what things depend on coral to survive? 25% of all marine species depend on coral. And uh, from uh, Fez in Morocco, why would coral choose to live so deep when it's so dark and cold? Uh, who wants to live in the dark and cold? So different species uh, are finding different parts of, the, of our planet and adapting to live in those conditions. So. To think that there are thousands, um, thousand at least species of reef growing coral, more in the deep ocean, all these animals finding different niches and different ways of surviving and getting food. Thank you so much. I was so much, so enjoying your questions. We r ran out of time. Uh, so thank you so much for being part of this live investigation. Do tune in in 45 minutes uh, for Pim's talk about exploring the deep reef. But until then, it's goodbye from Coral Live and goodbye from Curacao. Bye-bye.